Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com, and we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Rollbar. How important is it for you to catch errors before your users do? What if you could resolve those errors in minutes and then deploy with confidence? That's exactly what Rollbar enables for software teams. One of the most frustrating things we all deal with is errors. Most teams either A, rely on their users to report errors, or B, use log files and lists of errors to debug problems. That's such a waste of time. Instantly know what's broken and why with Rollbar. Reduce time wasted debugging and automatically capture errors alongside rich diagnostic data to help you defeat impactful errors. You can integrate Rollbar into your existing workflow. It integrates with your source code repository and deployment system to give you deep insights into exactly what changes caused each error. Give Rollbar a try today at no cost to you. No credit card is required. Our listeners get access to the bootstrap plan with 100,000 events for free for 90 days. To get started, head to rollbar.com slash changelog. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is the Change Log, a podcast featuring the hackers, the leaders, and the innovators of open source. I'm Adam Stachowiak, editor in chief of Change Log. On today's show, we're talking to Zed Shaw, creator of Mongrel, Mongrel 2, Python the Hardway, Ruby the Hardway, and so much more. We talked to Zed about a Twitter thread he posted sharing his thoughts and opinions about open source, corporations' involvement, dev culture, and so much more. So Zed, we invited you on to talk about a somewhat of an epic Twitter rant you went back on uh, in April. Um, but now looking at your Twitter, it looks like you have it on on private mode. Are you are you on hiatus? What's going on with your Twitter feed? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well, I have two Twitter feeds. So I have the one that's uh, uh, just a kind of me ranting about stuff, and then I have another one that's for my books. So like the Mister Professional author of books oh. that teach people, right? I live in two lives. And yeah, I live in two lives, uh, just like a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so what I did is I, I put that one on private just for a little while, just to see, you know, like um, uh, if it changes the way I say things. Um, also, just sort of like because I feel there's a lot of people who follow that Twitter feed, and then there's sort of like it's a different tone than the book feed. So mm -hmm. I'd rather have them follow the book feed because the gotcha. book feed is low volume, uh, much more positive, upbeat. And then my personal feed is me. It's my personal life and things I do. And mm -hmm. so I kind of kind of want to separate the two for a while. That's so but it's funny kinda, that you're like that, though. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone's like that. I'm just honest about it. Right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> OK, I'll give you that. It, yeah. Yeah. To some I mean, degree. if you look, it was look at all these people. Yeah. You look at all these people who are like, you know, oh, yeah, I'm Mr. Sensitive and I do all these things and I really love humanity. And then you find out that, no, they're actually giant pieces of crap. <laughs> you know? So, mm. um, yeah, I, I, I just I'm just honest about it. I'm like, you no, just wear I'm, it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a bad person, but I have no problem uh, speaking my mind, um, speaking out about things that uh, I seem to think affect other people or myself, um, talking about my personal life, um, things like that. And it's not like I have some weird personal life. It's pretty, pretty boring, you know. Um, and then there's also a lot of that personal account is a lot of art. So I do a lot of painting, and I think that doesn't mix for a lot of people. So I think there's a lot of people who follow me for the painting, you know, and uh, I'd like to have those separate and I can put some paintings out. I can do a lot more talking about art, things like that, keep it private and then direct people towards the more professional book programmer oriented things. See, I appreciate that because you know, a longtime Twitter user and, you know, we could probably just talk about the, the platform and the medium for an hour and call it a show, but we, we don't necessarily want to do that. But while we're here thinking about like channels and like, like segments of people and I follow a lot of people that will say like you know and, and I completely respect this take they have it's like but you get all of me like you're gonna get my software side you're gonna get my personal side you're gonna get all these things and that's fine but as a as a reader as a person who's like there there's there's people that you know maybe maybe I don't care about Zed's art for example just as throwing that out there and so exactly. you actually splitting those out for people is kind of a public service in certain ways for those that just want, you know, this type of a thing. Exactly, so. exactly. 
And also, like, um, you know, my books are targeted at beginners, and they're trying to learn to code. So I think it's kind of not right if I'm also in there ranting about how terrible the industry is mm. and, dis- and, and causing disillusion in people. You know, I, I am very honest in my books. I do say the job is not that great. It pays well, but it's not like the greatest job in the world. So it's not like I'm lying, but I'm also sort of being like, you know, well, you know, there's some in- issues in the industry. But for now, if you want to learn to code, just focus on learning to code, you know. Don't look yeah. at all that other stuff. And so, um, yeah, so my private account, I'm just going to keep it private for a little while and, um, you know, just basically talk and be myself like I always do, but then sort of shield people who are just, you know, just poor, normal folks who don't really care about the programming industry and just want to learn to code and they can go over to the other one and I'll be all nice. And this is the programming (laughs) side. Mm -hmm. You You think people are getting into programming for the wrong reasons? Um, not necessarily. So, I mean, everyone wants a job. Right. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, unless you're independently wealthy and you don't care. I mean, most people want a job. So it's reasonable. Like if you see people making lots of money programming, of course, you're going to want to go into it for programming and to make money. But mm-hmm. um, I think it's more that they're putting the cart before the horse. I think they're like, they're worried very much about how they're going to get a job before they even know how to code. And so my, my thing mm-hmm. is always like, don't, don't worry about that. Just focus on coding. Okay. Just get your coding done, get that out of the way, and then worry about how you can get a job when you know you can actually code. So you're the author of multiple books, like you said, for beginners, learn Python the hard way, learn Ruby the hard way. Um, and has been, you know, an author of many open source libraries down through the ages. I guess we can say ages now because internet time, right? So we had you on the changelog episode 34, which I guess makes Adam probably makes us feel old because that's 2010. Really might make, might make you feel old. Um, maybe not, but that was back talking about mongrel, mongrel two long time ago. Mm-hmm. feels like ancient history to me. Catch us up on your books, what you've been up to and uh, really, you know, don't give us like a deep history necessarily of, of everything between now and then, but just to introduce the, the audience to the context you have, um, with, with open source, with open source yeah. and with teaching people software and the industry at large. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think the best description of kind of my position in the industry is someone once said, uh, um, I'm the most famous a programmer can get without being a billionaire. And so, <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause I'm like, I'm poor. I, I, I'm, I'm, I try to be very honest and I've told people like, you know, you at one point, poor. I know, I mean, compared to like, uh, a lot of the other, okay. people, relative, like, poor. Relative. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not now. Right. But, um, no, there was a period of time when I was actually homeless and, you know, and like, uh, uh trying to work as a programmer and open source. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm honest about this thing and, and uh, so it's funny because, like, I think that I kind of like that description because it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's saying, yeah, there's if you want to be if you want to be famous uh, and actually successful, then um, you kind of don't want to be a programmer. <laughs> you want to be a founder and start a company. And, you know, mm. it's like um, but also it sort of that summarizes it. I mean, I'll own that, you know, I'm about as about as famous as you can get without actually running a giant billion dollar company. But uh, I don't know if that's actually accurate, but whatever, you know, I'll go for it. Okay. And then, um, I think the other thing about it is, um, you know, late when we did that in 2010, I was kind of on the cusp of kind of coming to this realization that open source really wasn't like the best way to move forward with my career. And I think it was right about the time when I started really pushing my books forward and, you know, sort of changing my career from being the guy who made all this software to the guy who uh, teaches people how to make software. And mm-hmm. That's been the big shift for me was that I shifted out of, I took that, that fame that was, you know, really not doing much for me as far as an open source developer and my skills at teaching that I kind of just stumbled on, you know, I wouldn't say I was like a, like an expert already, but, um, turned that into a new kind of career as an, a, an educator. I teach people how to learn to code, um, how to, you know, pick up new skills, things like that. I do a lot of live teaching now and, okay. um, that's sort of been my direction. And then on the side with that, I've been doing a lot of painting, you know, I love art and doing painting now. So aside from the obvious answer of read my books, like if you were to take somebody, a smart person who's not a programmer um, and turn them into one, like what's the, the happiest path in your opinion and in your experience from, you know, zero to employable? I know you don't you say maybe not focus on employment right away, but like to uh, let's call it proficient programmer what's the best way yeah yeah today? 
Um, I like to say, I mean, so uh, I think it's totally fine for people to get work. I mean, that's totally one of the motivations, but I try to say, look, if you're focused on work, you're going to miss out on the process of learning and building your skills. So I tell people going from zero to being proficient, you know, so proficient means you can sit down on your own and have an idea and turn that idea into a working piece of software, maybe not a pretty piece of software, right? Because I think pretty and beautiful and all that's sort of very subjective, right? Yeah. And I, I tell folks, I mean, you don't have to read my books, right? Like you can, because I don't have a book for every language or every skill. Um, you know, I tell people, just take any book and sort of do it the way my books do it. So take the books, get all the code working, then read about the code in the book. Because I think most books are actually written backwards where like they talk a whole bunch and then show you a little bit of code. And it's way easier to like get the code to work and talk and like just sort of get it up and running. And then go read what they say about the code because you get to see the whole thing in action. It's a lot easier to understand it. Uh. So, so a lot of times I tell people like, let, you know, let's say you want to learn Go. I don't, I don't do anything with Go. Um, I don't really have any plans for it. So they'll email me and say like, do you have a Go book? I'm like, no, no, but uh, take this book. It seems to be really popular on Amazon and it kind of doesn't matter. Just get all the code working and then just keep doing that and getting code working and understanding it and trying to make it work. And it's like learning a language and eventually you'll get pretty good at it. And then go out and either try to make your own little projects and put them out as sort of like a demonstration of what you're able to do or go find someone else. And this is the thing I advocate a lot is find some open source project and go in there and fix bugs. Just find the simplest bugs and slowly just keep squashing bugs. Just that's all you do. Don't make any new features. Don't add anything to it. Just squash bugs. And, um, so far that seems to work for folks, you know, like I'm saying, you don't have to read my books, but if you go through a bunch of books and get the code working and then go and squash bugs, that's a pretty good path. That's interesting too, because there's so many open source projects out there that are now, I mean, we've talked about this on this show and other shows to talk about like, how do you flag and give somebody an on-ramp? So there's so many on-ramps out there in open source to easily, you know, take that advice and run with it. Yeah. Yeah. I really think, I really think that, um, well, we can get into it actually, you know, I'm, I got a love hate relationship with open source, but I do think um, fixing bugs is kind of like the bread and butter for a lot of programming, especially entry-level programming, yeah. right? And the easiest place to find bugs to fix is projects that are totally open and you just, you fix the bug and you send them the code and they go, oh, that's cool. Thank you for fixing the bug. So that's one way to kind of like build up your skills and also get recognition for what you're doing and, you know, kind of build up a resume of what you're working on. Well, you don't have to ask yeah. permission and mm -hmm. no one's going to turn down a bug fix. Well, right, right. <laughs> well, not many at least, right? Very, very few. Less turn likely turn to. Down a less likely to. Yeah. Well, it's well like I you mean, merge. Uh, yeah. And, and, well, they might have a problem with your code quality. Right. But then right. usually they'll give you feedback to be like, oh, yeah. hey, man, you, you got to use these variables like this. And that's not really what I, can you redo this one? And now you're in a code and, review and you're learning. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and actually, I take this a little bit further because like, you know how you hear about those developers who do those, uh, they do an interview where they're like, you know, can you refer to the red black tree without using any memory? Right. You know, and I'm like, that's just the worst interview or, you know, why are manholes round? You know, like stupid mm -hmm. questions. And um, I'm sort of starting to advocate like, I don't know, like the, the programmers who seem to have the most value in an organization are the ones who can fix stuff. Like, you know how to mm. debug software. You're, you, you're just like super good at fixing things. And yeah. for me, I would love to have it where like you do your interviews and you hand them broken code and you say, fix as many bugs as you can in like two hours, you know? And then you come mm. back and you say, all right, let's see what you did. And uh, yeah, they just, if they, if they can prove they can squash bugs, that's the kind of uh, employment test I'd be looking for. That's true. Yeah. Give them a piece of software and say, fix some bugs. And is anybody doing that out there? I mean, that seems like, that seems like almost obvious now that you say it. I, mean, I'm, I know we don't have the whole industry in our heads, but I wonder if we know of anybody businesses. That I know are actually, nobody. Oh, all right. Nobody. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, probably there is, we don't know every industry. Yeah, Listeners. If, if, if somebody out there is doing that and you know about it, give us a holler. It's every day. Or email I us. mean, I can't yeah. reference any particular tweets, but there's definitely like, as we watch what we do to do, change log news and this show, Jerry, like I see those tweets and I see people say, I can't possibly deal with one more job interview to do what Zed just basically said. I, I can't mm -hmm. do that one more time. People you mean the bad that. way or the way he's proposed? Like you mean like the, In the bad way? Like I can't go through one more of those scenarios of like, why is this that way versus just like saying, Hey, can you code? It's, it's like these 
challenges that have no meaning. Right, right, right. I mean, is anybody doing it the bug squash oh, way? Okay, that's what I meant. Okay. No, no, no. Jeez, yeah. if we're missing that one, then Jeez, we're not watching because well, that's every yeah, day. Yeah. So, I mean, I have ton. Everyone has tons of stories where they go and they do a whiteboard, and uh, the guy is like, you know, yeah, can you um do a uh, find a substring in a string, you know? And if you don't, you could use a better algorithm. But if you don't do the algorithm that he learned in college, you don't know how to do it. So it's not even if you can do the thing they ask you to do. It's if you know the, what they know, if you're just like them. And I think that's the biggest problem with it is, sure, it's great. Everyone should know algorithms. That's a useful thing to learn. But if the point of algorithms is to make sure that you went to his CS105 class in MIT, then you're just filtering people based on kind of socioeconomic things, not really their skills. Right. right? experience things they've done with yeah yeah but bug fixing is universal doesn't matter what programming languages it is doesn't matter where you come from where you went to school if you can't fix bugs i don't think you can really code and so it's an easy test um you can also do it without making people work for free so you just point them at an open source project you say fix bugs and that's your that's your job interview and they just they fix bugs and it's it's done for free yeah it's an easy way to check that they can understand code uh, I think 80% of a programmer's work is fixing bugs, right? Like, I think if I sit around and like, uh, most of the time I'm coding, it's like, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. Oh, now it works. And that's Well, the rest of the time it. you're just writing the bugs, you know? Right. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're not fixing them, you're writing them. I'm a professional at that. <laughs> that could be a different job interview. How many bugs can you write in two hours? Uh, oh, that would be another one I would do. Like if I was going to hire someone for a security job, I would do the opposite. Like how many bugs can you hide in this code? Mm. Right. Cause then I would know that person, they know their security. Right. Yeah. They know exactly. That's interesting. I always uh, enjoy, I'm not sure if you're a fan of Mr. Robot, but that's kind of what I enjoyed about season one at least, which was like all this, you know, kind of how do things work and just the mind of a hacker and how they would get into or out of systems and, exploits and how they would use them against somebody. I don't think that way, but I love mm-hmm. hearing stories about someone who does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my favorite, uh, uh, I live in this building with crazy security. Like they, they've got, um, fingerprint readers and all this crazy stuff. And, um, I was getting really tired because the front gate, they're just like Nazis, man. They're just crazy. They yell and scream at you. It's just insane. Huh. And so, um, I started walking around the building. Right. And I found out that there's a back gate that has zero security and is never closed. <laughs> so I was kind of like, I go, all right, I'll just start going through the back gate. And it's like a whole other world. And I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of thing that sort of like describes software hacking is like a lot of times nobody really does anything like Mr. Robot style hacking. It's mostly the time that people just forgot to close the back gate and you're just walking right. through the back gate and you're just like, well, okay, I'm going to take um, all your Equifax data. <laughs> and yeah, you Exactly. Well, I mean, the most you know, famous hacker slash cracker back in the, was it the nineties, Kevin Mitnick, you know, yeah. he was, he went to jail and, you know, all these things he did. And at the end of the day, what he did most of the time was he just asked people for things and they just gave it. It was all social engineering because mm-hmm. a lot yeah. of times the, the humans are the weakest link and you just call and ask, it, yeah. oh, I thought I forgot my password. Will you reset it to this for me? And then they just would. So yeah, it's, it's security stuff, man, because you know, you got to secure every little aspect, right? All the surface area has to be secure, but on the other side of the coin, you only have to find one problem, you know? Exactly. So, exactly. It's just and almost I not found, fair. I, I found that there's also a sort of a correlation because if, if someone is very, like if an organization is very insane about security, and sort of touting that, um, usually they seem to be more like too focused on obvious security. And there's always some mm. really simple side chain that just gets around it. Um, mm. And so uh, it's really interesting. Like I like, um, uh, what was that? There was a bug in Signal recently where if you just sent someone an HTML document, you could completely own their machine. <laughs> and like wow. everyone tells Signal is the most secure thing ever. And the dude right. is not even checking HTML documents. And for me, I'm thinking HTML. No, you don't get that. That is not secure. <laughs> I'm like, you cannot send <laughs> HTML. That is the most terrible thing ever. Why would you want HTML? You know, but to them, they're yeah. like, yeah, sure. And then it, huh. they totally got owned like twice, I think. Even their fix got owned after that or something. Wow. Uh-huh. You said you have a love-hate relationship with open source. And you mentioned, and I'm not sure if this is a, a tough spot for you to to talk about, but you mentioned being homeless. I'm curious of the relationship of yourself and that time frame and open source and maybe what happened, what, 
was it your fault? What, what, how, how did this go down for you? Well, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, ultimately a lot of that is partially your fault, right? I mean, there's decisions that I made that I shouldn't have made. Um, but I think at the same time, uh, I had created this, these projects that all these companies were using. And at the end of the day, rather than hire me or, or get me consulting or whatever, they went the complete opposite direction and sort of seemed to go out of their way to tell everyone that my software was terrible. Twitter was, I think, the worst for that. And they were, they were using Mongrel at the time as an excuse for why their website wouldn't work. And it had nothing to do with Mongrel. You know, they, they just were terrible coders and that's why their website didn't work. But um, that uh, basically caught me up in being homeless combined with a couple other things and bad decisions on my own. But it was nearly impossible for me to find work within the Ruby on Rails open source industry at the time. And so that sort of taught me really quickly, you know, don't get involved, like don't get involved with these communities that promise you that you're going to become... You know, you're going to get a piece of the pie if you contribute. Mm. And after that, I turned all of my projects into, I'm helping the community, not the project, right? And by helping the community, I'm getting some sort of benefit from it. They're buying my books, they're hiring me, doing something like that. And that's um, the big change that came out of it. Uh, but the majority of the thing, like homelessness for me at the time was, you know, basically for about six months, I had to sleep with, on friends' couches and stuff and trying to scrounge for work. And didn't have anywhere to live, didn't have enough money to get an apartment. So when I say homeless, it's not like I was living on the streets doing on crack street. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, no, not, nothing like that. Yeah. But it's still, it's still sort of like a big distance between what should have happened, which is if my project is being used by these companies, then I should have been receiving some sort of benefit, even if all that was, was a job, right? And that's sort of like this unwritten contract in open source that we had were like, you know, the unwritten contract with corporations was if you wrote open source that they were using, you got some sort of job or consulting fees or at least some respect so that way you could find jobs. And I think there was also an unwritten contract with communities too, where like if you contribute to the community, you'll gain respect and a piece of the pie, right? And I think that was kind of like demolished that year. And so after that, I just kind of, I just kind of moved on. I was like, I started to realize that no, that, that contract has completely been rewritten. It's totally different now. And um, if you write open source, you're not going to get a job. And it's actually even now, I think, uh, what's been happening and part of my tweet storm and whatnot about open source is that it's gone the opposite direction where what I see is sort of like almost direct action to prevent open source from de developers from making money, which I find very strange. And I've been trying to think about that a lot lately. Did the whole Rails is a ghetto thing happen before or after that? Uh, actually, Rails is a ghetto happened after that as a response to me finding out that um, a lot of the Rails is a ghetto, or a lot of the Ruby on Rails companies were actively going out and preventing me from getting work. Wow. So this wasn't like I wrote, actually writing Rails is a ghetto helped me get work because it freed me from, I, I guess just going to say it, the oppression of the Ruby on Rails community, right? And that's a significant difference. And then... After I wrote that, and people were trying to come out and say that, oh, well, the reason you can't get work is because you wrote that. And like, no, 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 I wrote that because I can't get work. And uh, as we talk, you'll find out that's a common pattern where like you'll do something to defend yourself and then they'll tell you, well, you deserve everything that happened because of this thing you did to defend yourself. And it's sort of backwards, right? It's kind of, it's victim blaming basically. That's what I was trying to figure out the, the timeline there because I remember that and I, and I don't know the story well enough and here we are, you know. Mm -hmm somewhat face to face, at least audio wise, to, to discuss <laughs> yeah. this and voice to voice. Yeah, and I and I see that mm -hmm. in your history. I'm just wondering maybe what others assumed, which was like, did that cause your scenario or did your scenario perpetuate it? Yeah, my scenario perpetuated it because it keep in mind, I was working at Bear Stearns when I wrote that. So I was able to finally get a job and the only job I could get was working at basically this crappy bank in in uh, New York, a bank that eventually collapsed. That's how terrible that place was, right? And I was not making all that much money. Um, uh, pretty much joining Ruby on Rails destroyed my ability to work as a Java programmer because of all the animosity that David Hannemeyer Hansen created between Rails and Java. So the second I started becoming high profile within Ruby on Rails, I couldn't get work as a Java guy because they were, they were like anti-Rails to that point. 
you know, they were just, yeah. And then I find out all these, all these sort of like backroom deals that Ruby on Rails people made and a lot of the things that people were saying about me and stuff that Twitter was saying to defend themselves from investors wondering why their system collapsed all the time. And that was why I couldn't get work. And I'm like, all right, screw this. I'm going to write about it. And I came out and told the truth. This episode is brought to you by Linode, our cloud server of choice. It's so easy to get started. Head to linode.com slash changelog, pick a plan, pick a distro, and pick a location, and in minutes, deploy your Linode cloud server. They have drool-worthy hardware, native SSD cloud storage, 40 gigabit network, Intel E5 processors, simple, easy control panel, 99.9% uptime guaranteed. We are never down. 24-7 customer support, 10 data centers, 3 regions, anywhere in the world they got you covered. Head to linode.com slash changelog to get $20 in hosting credit. That's four months free. Once again, linode.com slash changelog. That brings us to to the tweet storm in, in question that caught both Adam and my eye. And uh, you know, we interview a lot of people on the show. We talk to a lot of people in the open source community, and um, so we see different perspectives. And one thing I appreciate about you, Zed, is, is you know, of course, some things you do say are inflammatory, and so that gets people worked up. But you you definitely see things differently than a lot of people. And I always I always appreciate like a separate voice and out there crying, you know, here's a different thing than what you're hearing normally. And so that's what caught my eye about, about this, what you were saying specifically around what you just said with regard to making money in open source and really the move of uh, corporations into uh, the community, which is something we've been tracking, of course, uh, over the yeah. last you know 10 years. That's it's, it's been very obvious that that's been something that's happened and it's very intentional. Um, so let's start with, I guess the most kind of the money quote and we'll just, cause it, 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 it plays right into what you just said. And I'll just read uh, this tweet back to you from, from the storm links are in the show notes for those that want to read the whole thing. We won't mm -hmm. read the whole thing here for brevity's sake, but, uh, you said in the end, open source is now the domain of corporations using code to illegally collude under the guise of peace and love hippie software projects. If you plan on releasing software, AGPL it and simply do it for self-expression. Save your real efforts for a real job. Yeah, basically. I mean, uh, that's okay, a pretty hey, dystopian view. I mean, that's, that's yeah, pretty yeah, bad. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess we're done. I mean, that's pretty much the whole thing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, can, I can explore on that, right? Okay, so, so it's sort of, yeah. So, okay, so it's sort of interesting that i mean do you feel that's controversial like you said it's dystopian but do you think it's controversial at all like do you disagree that corporations have kind of totally taken over open source and it's difficult to make money as an open source developer well i would say that it's always been difficult to make money as an open source developer so i don't think that's necessarily new um i would say that corporations have definitely moved in uh, in big ways mm -hmm. and have made open source a emphasis and because they have their just the pure weight of their size, right? We're talking about large technical corporations like Microsoft, like Google, right, like right. Facebook. You know, these are the big tech companies that giants. they're going to dom. Yeah, they're giants. They'll dominate any space they go into in software because of their pure weight. Um, exactly. So I agree with that. Um, illegally collude under the guise of peace and love hippie software projects. I don't <laughs> agree with that. Like illegally collude. I, that's where you lose me. Um, yeah, but yeah, I definitely, no, yeah. I definitely see where the game has changed and some, and I've seen that be good in some ways and I've seen it also be detrimental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, so it's, it's pretty straightforward to just say like, let's take just Google. So Google's entire company, right. Up until, I don't know what, maybe eight years ago when they started making go and their own stuff, right. Their whole company was based on open source, right. They use Linux, they use tools, they use everything. I don't really think they built too much of their own stuff, right? And in fact, they got sued for that, right? They were using Java and they weren't paying for it. And so they got sued for it, right? 
So if you take a company like Google, they are like worth what, $600 billion, something like that. Something, something really insane right now, $500, $600 billion. So right. they're benefiting from open source. And then the average open source developer that works on the tools they need makes almost nothing. Like, in fact, what we see is uh, an open source developer is going to die from cancer and he goes on GoFundMe and begs people for money for his funeral, you know? And then there's this company that's making $500 billion, right? And so that's the thing is it's, it's really obvious, but for some weird reason, programmers sort of all think that's okay, right? They can't really think about it. And in fact, they go so far as if you try to make money with your open source, like you license it GPL. I remember I licensed something GPL and uh, all these people from Django started yelling at me that I licensed it GPL. Like, how dare I try to make money on it, right? So we go to this thing where like this sort of like self-loathing, if you want to get paid, you're greedy. But the company who's making tons of money on your stuff is not greedy. That company's they're allowed to make that money. They're a corporation. But you, the developer, you should be helping the universe with your free stuff. And you're just a greedy jerk for doing that, for trying to make money. What, what do you suggest then? I mean, the, the, the thing of open source that the code is open and is free for everyone regardless of if you can make money from it or not, right? And so are you, by having this stance, are you saying that because these corporations decide to use the game, you know, use the rules of the game and use the software and make money from it, that they should somehow be required to give back? What, what's your point there? So I actually think that um, the thing that the corporations are doing is totally what corporations are going to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't blame them. That's a corporation. That's what they do, right? I think the bad thing is when we're telling open source developers that they can't be just like corporations, oh, right? Yeah. Right. So, I see. yeah, I mean, corporations are going to go out and do that. Well, I'm not surprised. Are you surprised? Like, I'm mean, totally not surprised. I have no problem no. with anybody making open source and making money from it personally. I yeah. No. Yeah. I encourage you, it. But, Please do that. But what we do is when I GPL'd something, all these dudes came out saying I was a jerk for GPLing my stuff because I'm going to make money on it, mm. right? Maybe, um, maybe they're just jealous. No, I think they, I think they, they really wanted to use my project without paying for it. That happens ah, a lot. I see. Yeah. Uh, Node started with a piece of my code. Node.js started with a piece of my code. And then uh, right after that, they needed a new license. So rather than pay me for the license, they created a, a separate project that just had my code in it. And then uh, Rydal emailed me and he's like, hey, buddy, can you just give me a free license for this? Mm. Right. Like, why are they trying to steal it from me? Right. They could just paid me and I would have been like, cool, like just pay me and I'll give, I'll do a new license and we're done. Right. This is, this is capitalism contracts, paying money exchanges. That's how it works. Right. Uh. So what, so my, my problem with it is that if it's right for corporations to be making money, it should be right for us to make money, but that's not what's happening. There's something else going on and it's been a while. It's taken me a while to sort of figure out that really this is sort of a strategy among corporations to kind of do three things at once, okay? And these are three things that actually happened to me, so, or that are happening. It's really easy to find it. And the first one is they're just trying to commoditize their complement, right? Have you ever heard of that strategy? So, yes. yeah, Microsoft, right? Like, so they, they sold operating systems, so they did a lot to commoditize hardware, right? Um, so if you're Google, you make all your money on ads. You don't need... You don't make money on hosting software. You don't make money on, you know, Kubernetes or any of that stuff. So what you do is you commoditize all that. You depress the market for those things. So that way it's always cheaper for you to run your infrastructure for the thing you actually make money on. Mm -hmm. So that's all, the, that's all these companies are doing. They're just, they're trying to use open source to commoditize their complement, which, okay, great. I mean, someone releases it and then they're doing it, no problem. But then I've sort of noticed that there's been a change and companies have started to figure out that if they keep, and, and I don't know if this is explicit or if it's just sort of like emerged from this whole thing, but if they keep open source developers poor, it's easier to grind them out and then take over the projects. And this, this happened to me with Mongrel. It happened to me with uh, Node.js. It happens to a lot of programmers where, you know, if you just grind some dude out, then you can take his code and he can't complain about it. He's not, doesn't have any power to say that you're taking advantage of him, nothing. And then the other thing is, uh, they use it as a way to collaborate with other giant monopolies. So code is, is language, code is communication. And so if you got 
people from Amazon and people from Google and people from Microsoft all working on Kubernetes, then they're illegally colluding. If they got together in a meeting and said, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to collaborate on a project to commoditize hosting so that way nobody can ever uh, make money on it, that would be illegal. Like if they said, yeah, we're going to collude to depress the price of ads, right? That would be illegal. But somehow they're able to go and collude on an open source project that depresses the price of a complement they need. What do you say when the foundation says, well, we're a neutral base? Ah, so that's the thing that... that's the response to that, that concern. Like, oh, but we're neutral. It's a foundation. We're neutral. Mm-hmm. We have, you know, TCT, you know, the, all the different acronyms to technical steering committees and all that stuff to, mm-hmm. to manage things and, and be, but guess who they work for? Exactly. Uh, uh, my favorite example is uh, every time some IETF standard comes out, it's always like two dudes from Google and someone from Mozilla, right? You know, like the standard and you look, it's like, oh, it's a Facebook person, a Google person, and then a Mozilla person because they need someone from a nonprofit to say that, yeah, 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 this isn't, this isn't uh, anything right. that, that was baked in a back room based on code we already had. This is totally about the community. So what's, what's, your, what's your response on neutral? Just that they're, they employ people to be on these committees or the foundations? Yeah. So my response is basically, uh, you know, show me the cash. So let's say you you join some, uh, 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 the Python software foundation or, uh, software freedom conservatory. I don't know if they do any of this, right. But if you're, if you're a member of that, if you're in the Python community, if your project is there and then they're constantly begging for money, but they have these giant corporations that are part of it, then you know that it's not actually, they're not actually a part of the community that they claim to be. I think the other thing would be if what you see is suddenly there's these directions that benefit the Googles and the Facebooks and whatnot and sort of screw over the individual developers, then these are not neutral organizations, right? And I think that's the biggest thing is um, I think even a lot of these organizations, they pretty much exist just to make sure that these companies have free resources. I I think my favorite example is uh, GitHub. So GitHub hosts all this open source, right? And they have investors from all the, like, from, like, companies that, uh, investors that invest in Google and other non, uh, other uh, uh, projects and companies and whatnot. And when you try to make money off GitHub, like, they've shut down projects that help developers make money on GitHub. And every time I've said, why does GitHub not have a buy button? Like, why can't you go to GitHub as a company and say, yeah, I want to just buy your license and you give me premium support or something like that. And yeah, because if they gave these developers easy access to revenue, to money, then all their investors would lose money because the compliments would suddenly go up in value, right? So now the price of the compliment that they're using, the web server they use, the small orchestration framework, whatever they're using goes up because, oh, well, if we want support, we got to go and pay this guy. But you should be paying that guy. You shouldn't be getting your support for free. And so, what I've started to sort of realize is there seems to be like a motivation or even a concerted effort to make it so open source developers can't make money. And I believe the, the two things to that are open source developers kind of deserve it. Like there's a certain thing about them that I don't know. They, the way they run their projects and the way they run their show seems to be that Mm. they just are open to it, you know? And then also the companies that are doing it, I don't know if it's super conscious but I know in my case, it was very conscious that um, they were trying to make it so I couldn't make cash and to take the project after I gave up. Um, so I'm kind of curious if it's with other ones. Let's look at the other side of the coin because you haven't mentioned at all. I mean, you mentioned Kubernetes, but you, you, you haven't mentioned at all the, the actual value add that these corporations have, have given freely. Like you said, that it's a good, stra- it's a good corporate strategy to, like you said, to commoditize your compliments. But what that does is that actually lowers the playing field for everybody. And people are building very successful businesses and careers based on software that they never could have written themselves. They never could have afforded to build a Kubernetes to uh, build a TensorFlow or these other, th- these other things that you know, wouldn't exist out in the open um, in the 90s, but now do because of these reasons. I mean... We always talk about bringing, you know, letting your code do the talking, like bring software, bring value to the community, contribute back, all these things. And I, I agree that I think corporations should be offering money 
to people. And in some ways they are, in other ways they aren't. Um, we're seeing more and more emphasis on that from the developer side of like, you know, not just being open source friendly, but actually being like a supporter or a sustainer of open source from these corporations who are doing very well financially. But what about all the value add? Because I mean, these are very huge software projects and many people are making livings off of TensorFlow that they just never had a chance on their own. Yeah. So in that respect, um, it's that sort of enlightened self-interest that they, that they're saying they do. Right. So a company puts out, I call it faux open source because it still serves the company. Okay. No matter what you do, what that company needs is what's going to happen. Okay. And I'd be fine with it if they said, yeah, this is an open source project you can use, but it's going to be in our direction. Okay. So they come out and they say like, you know, Hey, this is TensorFlow and you know what? Google's going to run it and we do our thing. And if you want to contribute, that's cool. But what we do, what we want first is what comes out as what's going to go in the project. But that's not what they do, right? What no, they I think do in is many they, cases, it is pretty clear. I mean, when we have these conversations on the show, like what kind of, we ask people, what kind of open source is this? Like, is this community driven? Is it a Google project that's open to be contributed to, but it, it's a Google direction? And they're historically very clear on those things. Even, hey, changelog.com is open source. And we just say right on the front, like, this is our CMS. <laughs> like, this is not going, yeah, yeah, we have yeah. a product roadmap. You can contribute, but this is not like a... And so I feel like in a lot of readmes, a lot of open source websites, it'll say right there, um, not all the time, grant you, and I know we're just picking on Google, but this, you know, as the example, um, but I don't think it's always unclear who's driving a project. I think it's usually pretty easy to, to either derive or it's explicitly stated in many cases. No, I think actually they, they kind of dance on the edge of it. I think what they want to do is they want to have sort of the community control that a sort of like kumbaya project has, but still also have their own control, right? It's never explicitly said, um, you know, like, look, uh, if you want this project to go in a different direction, Google's going to tell you no, right? They say, like, oh, come on, come buddy, come on, you can do it. You can contribute. But really, if you contributed something that was totally anti what Google wanted, they would shut it down. Well, you would just fork it and give it a new name and Go your own way, right? So I suppose, but I bet you anything, if you tried to do that, they would use the community to come after you. That's what happens all the time when you try to do those forks, right? Do you have any for instances on that? Um, do you remember uh, FFmpeg? I use it all the time. Okay, it forked tons of times. Um, okay. Numerous projects, they fork, and then, they, oh, Node. Node is a really good example. Node forked, remember they went to and called it something IO, had a huge IOJS. fight. Yeah, yeah, all over the uh -huh. place, the massive fight big uh, internal like and then uh, joint had to change its steering and its licensing and everything to fight it but they totally fought it uh -huh. they had all sorts of like propaganda going back and forth yelling all sorts of stuff fights it was it was like terrible almost destroyed node right we were we were pretty close to that one though i think there were a lot of community members knee deep into the io and node fork and bringing the communities back together so i think there were there were from my perspective there were plenty of community members that were what I would consider just peer to peer developers, you know, not corporations that were, that were, I guess they were leading IO, but then they were also bringing it back to this recombination of IO and node. Right. After they got giant to a, sort of agree to their things, because giant wasn't really running the project ethically. Right, they, they were doing exactly language. what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they weren't running it well. They were only doing what they wanted and what benefited them, right? But then claiming, oh, this is a community and we're all like friends, right? So then IO forks for that very reason. Isn't that a success story though? Isn't that just like the, the, the actual open source thing working? Like, okay, the joint was letting it languish. They wanted to maintain in control. And I'm just going based on memory. This was years ago. So maybe the details are not particularly clear, but... The maintainers, which was, you know, Michael Rogers and friends, uh, I can't remember the other names, but we interviewed Michael Rogers about it. They forked, they forced, forced Joyant's hand. A lot of changes happened. Like you said, there was definitely, you know, propaganda back and forth, or there was communication back and forth. There were blog posts written, right? There were conversations had. At the end of the day, I think the IO team, the forked team were very happy to recombine and keep it a singular community. I think they got a lot of the things that they wanted out of it. And so I just don't see how that's a failure of the, of open source in terms of really, if things aren't really going your way. A, well, I said it, if you just fork, right? And then you're saying that, well, then they right. force you back in or they, I can't remember exactly right. how you say so, it. So use the community against you or 
rally. Yeah. 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 So, so, uh, joint was worth like what, maybe $10 million. So Google's like worth like 500 billion, oh, right? It's definitely, yeah. It's not apples to yeah. apples. That's why I'm asking for examples, yeah. you know, See, I think, I think you don't get examples, right? I think this doesn't happen too often for two specific reasons. One is the companies that are doing this are huge. Like, like, can you imagine if you had an open source project and you decided you wanted to recopyright it and remove your license? And that would affect the bottom line of like, say, Amazon and Google. Let's say there's something they're using that you, they, you know they're using. You're, you're not making money. You're like desperate for work. They don't hire you. So you say like, screw this. I'm right. going to get rid of, no, you can't use my stuff anymore. You got to pay me. Now, I guarantee they're going to pump probably two, three million dollars into lawyers and just bury you, right? So nobody tries it. They know they're not going to be able to do anything about it. If you tried to fork Kubernetes, they're going to use uh, uh, the, just the way programmers are to keep people there, the way communities run, the way open source is sort of like considered um, a community thing. How dare you? They do this all the time, right? So I think it's just you don't have examples because that's, the system doesn't provide examples. And then I think the second reason that all of this is allowed, like, like I got to say, like I'm really not upset or really blaming the corporations for doing this because the programmers let them, right? Like, I can't say that corporations just do corporation. That's what they do, right? I mean, if they can make money anyway, that's what they do. So, I mean, they try to pretend they aren't that way, but that's the way it is. That's reality. So I actually, for a long time, I didn't blame the open source projects. I didn't blame anyone or anything like that in running projects. I said, this is just corporations exploiting people. But then when I started talking about how they sort of allow this, I would start, I would get like death threats if I criticized a project. And there was this whole other side to open source. And I just sort of started to see that like, really the reason these guys are getting exploited is because they're just a bunch of servile fascists. Like is they just like open source things though, being is in that charge. Just the internet. I mean, cause the mob mentality has infected the internet. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, but the thing that I think with an open source, right. Is Oh, so this is one thing that's really interesting about fascism is you find it happens whenever there's a new communi communication medium, right? Um, you find uh, rises in totalitarianism when there's a new way to talk to people. So this happened when radio came out. It came out when printing came out. It came out with like every time there's a new th way to talk to people, someone figures out how to exploit it to control the masses. So the internet comes out, right? And suddenly you can use that whole propaganda tactic again to get a new batch of followers and then ta-da, there you have it. But I think what I've started to find is like um, these, a lot of the people who are programmers kind of like that there's corporations taking advantage or harming the people that they consider their enemies in some ways, or that they have a project that thinks it's going to become the winner. The programming language is going to become a winner and wipe out every other programming language. And I'm like, no, that's terrible. Why would you want to wipe out every programming language? That's just awful. And I started to realize like, look, I think the reason why these corporations can do all this stuff, right? They can collude illegally and nobody cares and they can just destroy people's lives and take, take, take and never give back and all these sorts of things, right? Um, because you two have been saying, oh, well, they gave out Kubernetes right? But Kubernetes is not cash money to the people that wrote the open source that started their company, right? So really giving back is helping the programmers that made your stuff, not, oh, hey, thanks for making that stuff. Here's yeah. this thing you totally don't need. I actually asked Brennan Burns face-to-face -face at KubeCon last year uh, this very question. He was one of the founders of Kubernetes. I said, why didn't you just keep it for yourself? Why did, why did you, why didn't you turn it into a, a, a corporation yourself or a for-profit thing. He's like, it would have never gone how it has. It would have been the ride it has been. He had his own reasons, but he was like, you know, that's not the way it needed to go. Like it was by choice to do it that way. And he was one of the founders of the projects. Yeah. Actually, I think one of the other reasons why you can't really make open source is I think the, the imagination is you can just be a dude in your bedroom, you know, crank out some code and you're going to get a job or cash or something like that. And I think, no, I think now to run like a very successful, large open source project is so expensive, mm -hmm. right? That no, no small group of people being underpaid as a hobby can do it. I think you're now competing with 
a Google who has $500 billion and can hire a thousand people to work on their open source project, right? And you are not going to make a competitor to that. You're not going to be able to fork it either. Like if this is a project that takes a thousand people, what you and your three friends who hate it are going to fork it? No, you're not going to be able to do that. And then what are you going to get a job? Like, um, I remember Google interviewed the dude who made homebrew and they didn't hire him. Like they use his software and he can clearly make a piece of software and manage a team, which is way more important than any algorithms knowledge. And they turned him down because he couldn't reverse a red black tree. Right. And I'm thinking that's insane. Like that's not the important part of making software. You can look that up. Like, like what's next? I don't get a job because I don't know the name of every king and queen in England. You know, like it's, yeah. it's just so weird. Mm -hmm. I can, I can look that up. Like, why would I bother learning that? I can look it up, you know? And so for me, I think if, if, if yeah, Kubernetes totally made the right decision, like trying to run a project that large without support, without money. And then venture capitalists won't invest in a lot of these projects because if you invest money in a Kubernetes, right, that Kubernetes wow. needs to have a return on investment. Adam said founders of Kubernetes, it was founded inside of Google. So it wasn't like a startup that Google acquired like right. when he's, when yeah. they founded it, but they founded it as it was already owned by Google. So yeah, right. just to make, but that technically they could have, they could have not presented it. They really, they really pushed it to get funding inside of Google. They could have, I'm sure maybe I'm wrong, but I'm my, if I heard correctly, it sounded like there was a choice of, it could have been a Google thing or a, us three guys do this. I think it was three, three, right. three guys doing this originally. There was a choice. Well, they there. were Google employees. So, I mean, it would have right. been a Google thing. Yeah. Right. Anyways. So, so I think GitLab is a very good example of someone where like, it's two people, right? That mainly started it. And then, yes. And then they just ran it and then it got successful enough, right? That they were able to actually receive a, a pretty large VC investment, you know, mm -hmm. you know, but it's different. You can go with your crappy app that you hacked up in a weekend on your phone, do a pitch deck. If you know the right VCs at this company or whatever, they'll be like, yeah, cool. Here's 20 million. Right. So open source is a, a much, much higher amount of effort to prove that there's a market. And I actually think if the guys who did Kubernetes went off to investors and said, yeah, what we want to do is create this thing that basically makes it so you can craft your own like AWS infrastructure, whatever. They'd be like, hmm, nah, we don't want to do that because a bunch of our portfolio companies need free stuff. Now I'm just thinking of all the different people who built, I mean, another trend that we're tracking, and I, I don't disagree that it's, it's easy in 2018. I think it's probably easier in 2016 to get VC funded in the Valley with, with an app or with a, you know, just in general yeah. with a good pitch deck. I think it's, I hear it's getting harder. We're not in the Valley, so I've never... I've never written a pitch deck. I don't know those things very well. But what the other thing that we're saying, you know, we've been tracking this trend of of large organizations moving in, but also is VC funded open source projects, and uh, we're coming out of our ears with them. And so that's a path that a lot of people are taking. And I wouldn't say, I mean, when I say we're coming out of our ears, maybe a dozen or so that I could think of of, right, of projects right. that are that are making that work at least. You know, for now, we'll see if they can you know, go for the long run. But more than before. Yeah, more than more before. than before. Right. Mm -hmm. But so. it's still I, I bet if you look at them, the order of operations was not, hey, VC, here's my pitch deck and zero code. What, fund me so I can make this happen. I bet the order was I already have 20 million users, 5000 users, whatever. I've already got a working project. It's already used by all these companies. Give me some money to make it a product. And that's the difference. It is much, much harder to pitch open source to a VC. Now, if yeah. you do um, uh, any other kind of like if, I mean, basically, I remember if you were living in New York City and you wanted to make money in software, the easiest way was to make something banks wanted and write it in Java because they would just suck that up. No problem. Mm -hmm. It was just like, oh, oh, yeah, uh, you, you have a Java based web sphere based thing for managing doors. Cool. We'll buy that. You know? <laughs> and if you, if you wanted Ruby, no, no, that doesn't run on our infrastructure that we spent $20 billion on, you know? So I think, yeah, I think in a lot of cases, um, you know, it used to be, I, I really think that it used to be, there was this sort of like contract where if you did open source, you at least could get a job because I demonstrated that you could work. Right. And they sort of changed that up, right? Where now I think uh, the contract is, if you do open source, you better treat it like a job. Like you got to work for free, but act like you're a professional, 
okay? And sort of like kind of slightly inverted it. And then when you right. don't really want to work for free, like when you go, no, screw you. I don't want to work for free. That's, that's ridiculous. I don't want to work for free. They're like, oh, you're not a team player. You're a jerk. Uh. And that happens a lot. And, and all of that is part of this strategy. I don't know if anyone's articulated it as a strategy, but the strategy is if you keep the cost and the amount of money that these developers make down, then it's easier to take their project and use it and they can't fight you back. They can't sue you in court if you violate the GPL, all these things. And then you commoditize your compliment and off to the races. Yeah, I doubt anybody. I, don't, I doubt if you dig far enough into the vaults of these organizations, you're going to find uh, that game plan written down in a, you know, in, a pro, in a briefing that somebody proposed to their upper management as a game plan. Yeah. You know, um, I will say, based on the documents that we sort of saw from Microsoft about their embrace and extend strategy, Right. I remember there were things that they had said and when they got sued, right. Remember back in the day, a whole bunch of these emails mm -hmm. came out and we know what their strategy is now. I predict you actually are going to see sort of a similar embrace and extend strategy come out of Google and Amazon and whatnot. And we're going to find out that actually, no, they've just been sort of exploiting open source to um, pad their pockets. But again, oh, well, I mean, that's companies. Why are we surprised by that? I'm not surprised by that. And then I feel open source developers uh, of, of programmers in general, I feel are very, I, I don't know, I don't know why, but I think they're very fascist. I mean, it's really hard, like servile fascist, you know, this idea that, you know, totalitarianism, right? So like, okay, so totalitarianism is basically the belief that somebody else should control things and that's fine. Somebody else controls things seems to be like, you know, governments, societies, religions, whatever. But then they add on and anyone who disagrees with me is the enemy and should be destroyed. Right. So that's kind of like the simplest way to say that's totalitarianism. And then I like to say, well, fascism is just totalitarianism for profit. I just like, I just, I just put that out there. I'm like, no, if you're doing totalitarianism, you create an us versus them and you create an enemy and then you allow your followers to attack that enemy and then you do it. So that way you can make more money. You're a fascist. And what I see is a whole bunch of science. I've been talking about this since like around, I want to say 2010. I think most open source projects are run kind of like little fascist regimes. I mean, Python and Linux call themselves like the benevolent dictator for life. I mean, like it's, they say it's a joke, but I don't know. Right. I mean, those guys are kind of jerks. So, I mean, it can't be, it can't be that it's all a joke, you know? And so what I see is I see these programmers who like somebody else being in charge. They like watching their rivals be demolished or exploited or slandered, right? And they assume it'll never happen to them because they're part of the community. They're a part of it. And so they sort of like, they, they serve this sort of fascism. And it's a, it's a very gentle fascism. It's not like, you know, they're going out in the streets and killing people. But uh, just from my own experience, you know, you speak up about something and I get death threats. So I don't know. I kind of call it like I see it. If I see a bunch of people freaking out because I don't like Python, and uh, I see projects who call someone the enemy, you know, or, um, oh, my favorite is when they say they're going to win. Like, oh, JavaScript's going to take over the entire world. We're going to win. I'm like, why do you want to destroy all other programming languages? That's so weird. That's, that's only what something fascists say. So what I see is, yeah, sure. I think corporations are taking advantage of programmers, but I think there's so many servile fascists in programming that they kind of agree with it and they kind of like it. And so there's no way to fix it. There's no way you're going to stop them. Like there's no fix. It's just, it's just how they are. And the only way to fix it for yourself is just don't go into that. Don't try to make money in open source. Try to maybe build up a career, but stay very far away from the communities. Don't identify yourself with any one language or project or anything like that. And just basically, you know, play the game and try to get out and get ahead without getting hurt.
Open source is what fuels new industries and pushes long-standing ones forward. In its 20th year, OzCon continues the tradition of bringing you the latest technological advances and a path to successfully implement open source in your workflow. OzCon 2018 features frameworks like TensorFlow, MXNet, and PyTorch, two blockchain projects like Hyperledger, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, as well as infrastructure disruptors like Kubernetes, Prometheus, and Istio. You'll get an insider's look at the open source implementations that will have the most profound impact on your business. Enjoy new events like live coding sessions and the OzCon Business Summit. And don't miss the fun evening events and receptions, the open source awards, and plenty of networking opportunities for everyone. Save 20% off with code CHANGELOG on gold, silver, and bronze passes. Head to OzCon.com to learn more and register. Hey, Zed, is the um, cat-v uh, link to Rails of the Ghetto, is that the canonical? Google says it is. I'm just curious if that's Cat you. Dash V? Uh, Harmful.cash-v.org is where the main Rails is a Ghetto link, links to. It's by Zed's So Effing Awesome. Um, actually, I think that shouldn't be up there. Is that rehosted or something? No, I took it down. So I'm going to have to sue that person and make them take it down. Did you take it down off? Of, was it on your personal site back then? Yeah, it was on my personal site. Is it down? I like you take it down. No, I, you know, I think, uh, People should be allowed to move on with their lives, right? So it's not supposed to be on the internet anymore, and we can't link to it anywhere. Um, go ahead and link wherever you want. I mean, that's fine. Well, I mean, obviously, but, but I, I mean, I'd... it is it is ancient history in a lot of ways. Like, yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> it is, it's... but that's like ten. What is it? Ten years ago, right? Got to be more than two thousand eighteen. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, yeah, yeah, time time to move on. I yeah. was a way different person in two thousand seven. Just so you yeah, know. me too. So I agree with me you. too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we all were. I'm yeah. thinking just more for like if the listeners are like, what the heck were they talking about? Is there a link to it? Because we, we would get yelled at for not having links to things, especially right. something like they want to dig into. It's like, well, I would say go ahead. I mean, uh, you know, I am sort of honest about myself and I did write that. So, I mean, if you link to it, it's no problem. Um, I think one of the I mean, and it, it, I'm going to contact this person and tell them to take it down because I own the copyright. Um, you can also probably find it on archive.org, a few other things. Right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if you do, just, you know, I would say preface it with uh, Zed took this down because he wanted to move on with his life. So, you know, this is Zed circa 2008 and uh, he's different, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because like I would say... Yeah, I was making fun of uh, people who are overweight in there and I don't agree with that, you know, and I was... I was saying like a lot of, you know, pretty terrible things, but at the time it was sort of like this cathartic, like I just wrote how I felt at the time. And, uh, and you know, part of that was, I actually was being threatened by certain people, um, and stuff like that. So, I mean, a lot of the things that I say in there are at specific people, but I don't believe in like making fun of someone's disabilities or anything like that. You know, I think there's mm -hmm. some things in there that I actually am ashamed of, you know, so I took yeah. it down, you know, yeah. oh. we got a link to it. I mean, they can Google it. I mean, if they they can Google it, we don't have to link to it. We're so one thing said for us is we're we're definitely we're about we're about lifting people up rather than putting people down. So our goal is not to shame you, nor we want to perpetuate you being shamed. So you know it could be Googled, and that's something that's like not exactly pertinent to our conversation. So I have no concerns about linking to it. Like, I just want to make sure if we do, we are linked to the right place. That's what my concern was. Not that. We can find you and get you. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> you know, that's, that's no problem. Was... But, you know, I mean, I will say I have no problem with people disagreeing with me and telling me why they disagree with me. Um, I, I, I don't know. I come from a different era, I think, where, like, you can disagree with someone and not hate them or think they're a terrible person. You know, you can have wonderful disagreeing conversations. But I think what happens, I don't know if it's just a thing about Americans, I don't know, the Internet. I think they take disagreement to be an argument and sort of like an attack from an enemy, right? Uh -huh. And to me, I'm, I'm very different. I'm like, well, no, I can disagree with you and I can still, I don't know, like, like you and Right, I think you. the line between yeah. disagreement and hate and dislike is, can be, has gotten to some degree closer. Yes, like I, yes. It, Because I don't agree with what you say doesn't mean I don't like you or I can't show you love or be kind mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, help you or serve you or do something for you or be there for yeah. you when you need somebody, like, because right. I don't like the way you do things doesn't mean I, I don't like you. Right. Exactly. But you know, people yeah. think that I think, way. 
I know. I don't get it too. Cause I've been, I mean, I, don't, I think Zed probably just looking at your career, I probably trail you by five or 10 years maybe. Cause when you were writing mongrel, I was like just learning how to write code back then. Mm -hmm. Um, me too. But and so my point, but you said maybe it's your age or maybe, you know, um, just with the generation that you're from, but like, I just don't, I don't get offended when people disagree with me and vice versa. Like, I just feel like that's life, like discourse. That's, that's, that's yeah. how we learn and grow and, and live. It's like, we don't have to yeah. all. And so I guess, I mean, some of that leads back into the show because I see what you're saying, you know, with regards to specifically like with this, maybe we should just start the show, but uh, yeah, the yeah, developer yeah. fascism thing, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I identify and I identify as a developer, but I don't feel I don't see those things in myself, and I don't see those things in like, I see that, like nuanced what you're saying, and um, I feel like you're saying it in a blanketed, almost like matter of fact way that I I feel is maybe overstepping, but maybe you're just matter of factly stating your conclusions of something that you admit is is yeah. is nuanced and and into a minor. You should start degree. there because yeah. we almost ended that last segment with me saying that I disagree with Zed. <laughs> I mean, well, if we didn't have to end the segment for time wise, I would have said, just would have said that I, I disagree. Just don't, and I don't agree with it. you, Zed. I just don't agree <laughs> but because that's your experience. Yeah. So this is the thing: is I'm not saying it's a blanket statement on every programmer. However, sure. um, I do think that it is very endemic in how the tools work, how the writing has been, how the industry has been run. Um, I think it's so, like, I think it's just there so much. It's, like, so everywhere that they don't even notice it a lot of times. Um, and also, I think a lot of these people where they're like, you know, oh, I'm totally not like that, right? And then you see, they see other people being like that, and they say nothing. And mm -hmm. I think that's the thing. I've never, mm -hmm. ever had anyone stand up to an abuser of me and say, Hey, leave him alone. He's just saying, he's just saying he doesn't like this or he doesn't like Python. You don't have to be like abusive. Right. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anyone say that ever. Right. Mm. So there's two types. When I say a servile fascist, I don't mean someone who's out there, you know, like doing it. I mean, it can be someone who actually really enjoys it and supports the, the regime and goes along with it and never disagrees with them or someone who allows the regime to do what it's doing or the corporation doing what it's doing and then just assumes, well, you know, it doesn't relate to me, so I'm not going to do anything about it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to stand up and help that person. Nah. Yeah. Let me, let me present this angle because, and I have never been in, I've never been around the circles wherein you are, you know, disagreeing with Python people or somebody's attacking you. Um, so I, I can't, I can't give the contextual thing, but I will say, mm -hmm. You know, back for, but I think I was reading Rails as a ghetto back in 08 or whenever, and I was in the Rails community back then. Mm -hmm. And my take as somebody who's completely on the outside, but in the community to a certain degree, was like, and this may be so completely myopic, but like Zed is a guy who does not need anybody's help in terms of staying up for himself. Like you do very well and you represent your side very well and strongly. And so I wonder if a lot of the inaction that you've experienced, which I'm not necessarily excusing it, saying, and therefore nobody needs to help you out or anything, but um, on the internet, you come across as somebody who's very what can very well take care of himself. And so mm -hmm. maybe that means people just remain silent because they think, well, people think people are attacking Zed and Zed is defending himself or attacking back and it's just kind of a sideshow. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I actually tell people don't help me, right? Because the collateral damage to people who help me is pretty great. So I tell people like, hey, don't worry, I can take care of myself, right? But if we're talking about the general kind of population, open source projects, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Then you mm -hmm. don't really see this anywhere. I'll give you a, a really, really good example from Python. So there was this project by Aaron Schwartz called web.py. And web.py was great. They, they made Reddit with it. Originally, they did Reddit in Scheme, and I guess they did it in this. And Aaron Schwartz was working there. And it was awesome. It was so cool. Like you just like, it was, worked really well. Very tiny, very small. And at one point, I guess uh, Guido, the benevolent dictator for life for Python, tried it. And he decided that it was terrible because it had too much magic. Uh -huh. So rather than someone saying, hey, uh, aren't you supposed to support people in the community and not trash people's projects? Because, I mean, you are supposed to be the benevolent dictator for life. Everyone decided that his project was terrible. They said, don't use it. Every time you tried to use it, they went, oh, it's terrible. And then they banished magic through all of Python. And by magic, they just meant usability, really. 
like, you know, shorter names for function calls. I remember the, <laughs> I'm serious. In really? Django, I remember that. I was like, yeah. just metaprogramming. No, like they still did metaprogramming. Like go look at Django. Like it's, it's ORM is tons of meta metaprogramming. But what they did is to make it not seem like magic, you had to type render to template, right? And then there was another one, render to template with session or context. It was like crazy. And I'm like, why can't I, why can't I just have render? Oh, well, that's magic. I'm like, no, it's not. It's just easier to use. And so, and you can also say, you know, magic is just like, you know, like what's that, that quote, um, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. So you can, you can say the opposite is, the only reason you think something's magic is because you're uneducated. So these are people who are saying like, that's magic. I'm like, well, you just got to learn how it's done. That's all. If they're making it easier to use and, you know, you can go read the code. The code's there. So I think that's a, a really good example. Nobody really stood up for him. I remember I was one of the few people who was like, that's stupid. This thing works great. I put it in my book. People ranted at me. Why are you putting it in your book? You should just other project that doesn't have any magic. And I'm like, okay, this is a, a developer who worked on stuff he's a part of your community and you're allowing someone to just blanket decide that this guy is terrible for writing his project and nobody should use it and the way he wrote it should be banished and you're agreeing with that and nobody's telling the benevolent dictator for life uh yeah just why are you doing that that's wrong he can make his projects and yeah what was the specific things done there because on the other side of that coin like guido's completely uh, he has the right to his opinion on software and because of his position, it makes sense that people respect his opinion. And, and so there's like a natural leadership there that doesn't seem counterproductive. Um, and so, and I don't know, again, I'm, I'm missing the detailed context of like, and then he did this and it was mean, or it was like, was he criticizing software based on, you know, his own ideas of the way software should be written? That seems like a constructive thing to do, you know? Not really. Because it's just style based or no, it was because um he didn't like the way that it used these features of Python that were metaprogramming. That's it. That was all it was. But didn't he write the those end features? Result, cause... Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, well, if you don't <laughs> you like that, left then the metaprogramming out, maybe. Just, just, just don't have that ability, right? What it was though is some projects could do magic, but not this project could do magic. He had no problem with magic and all these other things. He has no problem with magic being done throughout the Python libraries. He has no problem with this magic, just this one guy's, right? And then the actual point of the discussion, yeah, you're right. Guido's in charge, whatever. We're talking about being, people being servile fascists. So everyone who just went, sure, yep, alrighty, and agreed with them and just, and then also went on the offensive and banished all magic from their projects and totally believed him without thinking about it are what I'm talking about. Those are the people who are making it so that it's easy to exploit open source projects and take advantage of them because a corporation comes out and does whatever it wants and everyone's like, yep, sure, okay, yep, I agree with that. Regime should be in charge and anyone who disagrees should be destroyed. <laughs> it's kind of like brainwashing or mindless, uh, mindless yes, followership. It is. And, and the thing is, is the, the slickest form of that is the kind where people don't realize they are and they just sort of believe it and it's endemic everywhere. And they just sort of like, they think that's normal. Well, you had me worried because I was worried that, that I was some of these people, you know, not even knowing it, but I'm not obviously, but you had me concerned that somehow I was brainwashed and I'm just unknowingly out there as a fascist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, I, th I actually, I think fascist is the wrong word, but there's not much of another word. Like I could say totalitarianism, but that's typically not with a profit motive. The reason all these people are doing this is they all hope to make a piece of the pie. They all hope to make some amount of money off of it. And that's a, historically, that's a thing about fascism is there's always this corporate uh, element to it and things like that. But I think it's got to have a new word. I mean, I could just say they're just totalitarians, but um, there's a difference between being a totalitarian, a totalitarian is trying to do it without trying to make any money and they, they are true believers. But all these people are trying to make money. They want a piece of the pie, right? Mm. So that's the only reason why I say they are. But in the same way, like, I mean, yeah, sure. Not everyone in a fascist regime is totally fascist, right? Sure. Um, yeah, they're not totally fascist, but if they're allowing it to happen, maybe they're servile, right? They're just sort of like going along with it because, hey, they're not coming after me. So I'm trying to think of, uh, of um, some of the things here. So self-identification seems to be, uh, I'm trying to think of the drivers of this. And I'm, you see, you have a lot more experience with uh, maybe like, 
pointing this out in your own mind or like pinpointing, like that's what this activity is than I do. So I'm like very much processing and trying to think of examples because we've been very active in open source for a long time and like having these conversations. Um, and so I can see some of what you're saying, but I haven't like been part of like on watching an attack you know, happen and then like nobody say anything types of things. So obviously I can give you a super good example, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I came out and, uh, I was going to do a new Python three book and I tried to use it. It was slower. A lot of the features were not very good and I would test it about every year. And so finally it got to where I could kind of do it. So I said, all right, I'm going to do a Python three book, but I really don't agree how the project's going. And I would tell people this all the time and, and they would shut me down. So I wrote a thing. I said, yeah, don't use Python three. I'm going to do a book on it, but it's not well run. It's not well uh, written. It's, um, it's basically just like not a good project, right? And this is my opinion as an educator, the person who wrote one of the main Python books, a member of the community for a while, everything, okay? And immediately after I wrote it, two high profile members of the PSF proceeded to go to all these people who wrote books and try to get my book removed as a mention in their book. And People came to me, they're like, yeah, so-and-so and so-and-so are going around. Here's their chats, trying to get people to stop using your book because you don't like Python 3. That's it. Just, I don't like Python 3. That's all. And I asked my friends or the people who tell me this, I'm like, well, okay, well, why don't you say something about it? And they're like, oh, I'm afraid. I'm scared that I won't be able to work or that they'll come after me next. So even people who claim to be my best friend can't stand up to these people. This kind of like, you know, oh, if you criticize our project, you're the enemy. And we're going to go after you because you might make it so we can't make money on it. And then interestingly enough, like, um, oh, my favorite was someone tried to write uh, a blog post saying I'm unqualified to teach Python 3. And uh, this person previously had recommended my book. So I'm kind of like, okay, well, so does that mean Python 3 is unteachable? Because if I can't teach Python 3 then I don't know if anyone can teach Python 3, <laughs> right? Because you're teaching Python 2. Yeah, like what's the huge, yeah, like what's the huge difference in my, uh, like, I, and then this person was recommending my books before this, so either they're right. lying about my books being good and they were giving them out, or they're lying about Python 3 being awesome and I'm just a terrible <laughs> teacher, <laughs> right, you know? Yeah. But not a single person, I didn't read a single blog post from anyone, not a single email, Nothing, even my best friends didn't stand up for me. Nobody came out. People told me that they would talk to members of the PSF and they'd say like, um, yeah, you know, what do you think about Zed's post? And members in the PSF would say like, oh, you know, Zed was the best thing to happen to Python, but I'm never going to say that because it'll be really bad for me. So your best friends, did you, so with my best friends, uh, like if a stranger offends me, it's kind of like whatever, you know, especially someone in the internet. I mean, it doesn't, not, not, not that it doesn't hurt, but it's not going to affect my day to day, but my best friends don't stand up for me. I would turn to them and say, what's up with this? Like, why didn't you, why yeah. aren't you, so did you talk to them? Like, what do they say? Why aren't they going to come They're to afraid. your side? In a lot of ways, I can't blame them because this would be their livelihood gone. If they stood up to the PSF and, and, and did what I did, they would, they would. So if be, they say, where was Zed? They're going to lose their jobs or, or what? That's what they're worried. Yeah. They're worried. They won't get their consulting gigs. They won't get their jobs. They'll be banned from the PSF because that's exactly what they're doing to me. So they're like, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell Zed it's going on, but I'm not, I'm not going to stand up for him. I can't do that. And this is very common, like all the time. And I'm in a unique position because, I mean, after I wrote that and they tried to ban me, my sales went up. I mean, I, I, I kind of, yeah, it didn't do anything to me. Um, I do, worked very hard to make sure that I get put out something good that helps a lot of people. And, you know, it works. So, you know, I, I try to make it work as best I can. And so it didn't inf impact my sales, didn't impact my traffic, didn't impact anything. Um, and all their plans failed. Like, I mean, so what? You take me out of other people's books, big deal. But it still kind of hurt that, like, nobody stood up to take care of me. Or at least just, I mean, my friend didn't even tell them, you're an ass. Like me, if someone did that to my friend, I'd be like, Oh no, we're going to have a problem here. Like I would just l unload on them. So that's, that's like my biggest, like that happens way more often than people want to admit, but I think it doesn't happen too often because the culture of programming now is that everyone kind of goes with the projects. They're all very servile. And then when the next one comes along, they just leave rather than trying to fix or change or contribute in that way at, in the previous project. What, what do you think it is? I mean, not saying that you deserve this, but what do you think it is that you've done? 
or been involved in or around that may make people feel this way about you? I think it would start with rails. That's, that's where I mark the shift. Cause before that, um, yeah, people, I feel like people in open source had a different attitude about it. That was much more, uh, collaborative or, uh, uh, discourse based. You could totally disagree with the way someone did something. And then, no, I would say Java then rails changed it to be, you could use this sort of marketing tactic that was really similar to kind of like a fascist propaganda to convince people to join you and become rabid fans. And I think for me, I just have a very strong streak against that. And so when I speak out against it, it obviously threatens what they're doing and also kind of questions people's core identities. Cause the whole point of all this, this kind of running a, a, a project like this with this kind of like fascist style propaganda is you become their core identity. And so if there's this one guy who comes out and is like, Oh yeah, no, no, look, that's wrong. Somebody shouldn't do that to you. You have, you know, they're like, no, no, you're wrong. And then they get really angry. Yeah. And it's understandable. I don't actually hate, any of the people who really necessarily don't like what I have to say, I don't really hate them. Um, the only people I really have a problem with are people who send me death threats because I don't like Haskell, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, people. You, have you actually gotten death threats because of that? Yes. No, you don't understand. Like, <laughs> I don't understand. I'm trying to understand over here. <laughs> it's so weird, I, right? That is weird. Look, look uh, you can think I'm a jerk, right? I'm totally fine with that. You can disagree with what I say. I'm totally fine with that. But the response has to, has to match the offense. Yeah. Cause so if I go, exactly. If I don't, if I don't like Haskell, you go, yeah, well, I don't like your project. Okay. There you go. Cool. Like you don't like a project, right? Maybe you can say, I don't like your face. I'm like, all right, uh, that, that's weird, but okay. But if I go, I don't like Haskell. And then you send me this insane email about how you, I should kill myself. <laughs> then, you know, that's a kind of a disconnect. All I said was one tweet where I'd made fun of Haskell. And you want me to kill myself. That's a huge distance between what I did wrong to you and what you think should happen to me. Well, since you brought it back to, to Twitter, um, this tweet storm we, we talked through here, which we did go through all of them. And I'm not sure we can actually link to it because your account is protected, at least now. Um, yeah, yeah. But we do have uh, a version we could PDF and host it if that was okay with you. But aside from that. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what was the, what was the response with, I mean, you said lots of controversial stuff in this tweet storm. So, I mean, what was the response? Any death threats? Any, any threats at no. all? What was the response? No, that's the thing that I find very interesting. I think all the responses were positive. Um, the only responses I got were mostly along the lines of like, you know, the libertarian flair of, well, that's corporations, right? <laughs> you know, and that's right. about it, right? Um, which is what got me thinking like, wait, you don't have a problem with this? That's kind of weird, but okay. But um, the weirdest response that I got was all these people came out and they said, hey, we're going to try and solve that with blockchain. You wouldn't oh, believe it. No, no. Blockchain solves all problems. See? Yeah, yeah. No, this was bizarre. So I had these people who were like, yeah, what I'm, what's going to happen is you, you put your project in my blockchain, my licensing open source blockchain. And then people say, yeah, 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 I bought that thing. I'm going to use that thing. And so then, and then you get coins. And, and so when people use your software, you get coins. And so, so I'm kind of like, I'm like, okay, okay, can I just get cash? Because like, I got to pay rent. <laughs> I got to yeah, like exactly. buy food. I can't, I can't use like open source coin down at the Walmart, right? So like, can I just get some cash money? And they go, oh, well, I don't think anyone would use that. They think that they're only going to use a blockchain based licensing system. And I'm kind of like, no, I think exchanging money for licenses has been around probably as long as there's been humans. So yeah. I think, I think there are people pretty okay with that. Just throw up a PayPal and then pay me money. And nope, they're, yeah, that was the weirdest one. Like everyone did that. Well, when all you have is a hammer and that hammer spits out coins, you know, everything looks like a nail. You're just like, um, oh, blockchain that get some coins. So one thing I did think that, and, and so I, I don't want to ruin someone's like, you got an idea, go with it. I'm, probably not a very good predictor of what's going to take off. So rock tried blockchain. If people use it and programmers are getting paid, then I'm happy with that. Go for it. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, but whatever. So the one thing I did think is one problem is if you're an organization that's really huge and you would like to pay developers, you don't know what software you're using. Like it's really difficult to account for, like, let's say you're running thousands of machines to power your website, right? You know that there's some hidden GPL in there right? You know, there's GPL code in there. So what you could do is a blockchain's only really useful thing would be you could register code into it 
And then organizations could use that registration to confirm whether they are complying with licenses, whether they need to release software or whether they need to contact you and get a license. So I think that would be something viable. And you would probably just have to sell that tool to large organizations and then offer programmers and say like, yeah, what we'll do is we'll send you a report with all these companies that are willing to say, hey, yeah, we're using your GPL. We made these changes. Here you go. Right. And act as a proxy and solve mm-hmm. that problem for them. But otherwise, I don't know if I'm getting coins, I don't think I can eat. So <laughs> I want dollar bills, you know, <laughs> the best coin ever. <laughs> well, I mean, I can agree, I can agree on on one part where the blockchain makes sense as a ledger. But yes, yes. It, the coin part, obviously, is the stretch. It's like, well, not really a lot of value there. And there's a lot of volatility. It's the easiest way yeah, to cap and, that. Well, and the ledger there. isn't the hard part of the equation, right? right. Like the, le- the ledger is, is workable. It's the, That's easy. Yeah. It's like the social constructs and it's the industry and mm-hmm. uh, there's a the lot buy-in. more. There's a lot bit. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot bigger problems to solve than like, how are we going to prove that this is happening in a right. like, distributed, a just decentralized fashion? And Tether, you know, somehow makes it, you know, tying it to the real world. Well, so one of the things that you, that you would get with a blockchain solution is companies are kind of really scared to announce what tech they use because that's how competitors can compete with them. So if they're able to do this locally, right, with like this distributed database and then reach out to the people that they owe code or money to, then they might be into that, Mm. right? So that way they don't have to make out, they don't have to make calls out to some central repository that's tracking everything they use. They can keep that a secret. Which you can run data analysis on and machine learning and algorithms and ranking. And can you imagine if like you, you were a company and you were doing this, right? Everyone's like checking their software and you've got the central database, you know, every company and all the things are running. Right. And then your competitor buys that company. Right. And you're like, oh man, now they know everything we run. So if it's like blockchain distributed, you just do that locally. You're like, okay, cool. People are registering their source code into it. And then you look and go, oh, right. And then the next step is you go and hand that person money or code. Like if it's GPL, you give them their code back or you say, hey, we don't want to give you our code back. Can we just pay you cash and exchange, quick exchange licenses and you're done. So in your opinion, if if every corporation were to uh, agree that the best thing they could do with regard to open source software is to give cash money in whatever denomination the developer desires, right, according to their locality, to the people who are writing the open source software that the company runs on, um, what would be the, the threshold or the, like, are you talking like a percentage of net revenue? Like how would that break out? That would make Zed happy of like, okay, now everything's right in the world because these companies are doing X. What would X look like? Yeah. You know, I mean, um, if you take say a company like Google, they're worth like 500 billion, 600 billion. So you're looking like 1% would be like $50 billion. I think that's more money than like all of the open source industry ever made in its entire existence, right? So it wouldn't take much. Like you could do fractions, like Google could go down to $1 billion and it would still be so much money, you know? So it doesn't have to be very much. Um, I, I don't think this will ever happen, by the way. I think this is, oh, I think no, actually that's why I said it's, yeah, this is it's in your fantasy. Like exactly. never going to happen. I think actually what's going to happen is people are just going to stop making open source and then these companies are going to be fairly desperate. Um, but I think if they donated like fractions of percentage and they just gave it as direct money to developers or worked it in the system where like, you know, Hey, we will just want to pay you to work on this, doing exactly what you're doing. And we'll just pay you salary as an employee. I think we used to do that. It doesn't happen as much anymore. Well, you've definitely seen that happen. I, it's something I would love to see happen a lot more. A lot more, right? A, a typical typical strategy is, oh, hey, buddy, you want to come work on your open source? Oh, sorry. Can you go move that CSS button over two pixels left? Don't work on your open source. It's like a bait and switch, you know? Mm, once you get there, you're not working on it anymore. Totally not. Yeah, you're working on mm. whatever is going to make the company money, right? So... I think if they just started, so I think if they don't start making it so that open source is a viable career choice where I can say, I'm an open source programmer, I work on this project, and this project gets this much from these companies that use this software to keep it going, and then that open source project slash company hires people to keep working on it, right? then I think they'll avoid the problem in the future that I suspect, which is all of this just collapses, right? 
where if it's, it's not like it's going to be a, like a violent revolution or anything. It's just people aren't going to make open source. I mean, like, I don't want to be like that guy who was, when he died, he went on GoFundMe to beg money for his funeral. I want to be someone who's got a job and starts my own company and puts stuff on the internet myself and make my own apps. I don't want to work for free. Well, it's, uh, it's been a fun trip down this lane with you, Zed, going back to the beginning of, of uh, your open source career to on through to this, to this, I guess, happy place you are. You seem happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mostly happy. You got yeah, your rants, but you're happy. You're, you're making money. You got your books. You're doing education. You're helping developers. Making music, making art. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think one of the things that people sort of misunderstand is they they sort of see a one sided person in everyone, right? Like you, you, we're very good at stereotyping people into one thing. Yeah, and so they think if I disagree with the way open source is run, that I'm an angry person. I totally hate it. I'm miserable. But it's not true. It's just you know thoughts, disagreements. I maybe word them a little strongly, but it doesn't mean like I'm like in my bathroom trying to cut myself to the latest. Uh, you know, cigarettes after sex album or something, you know, like it's not, I'm not doing that. I'm just typing thoughts. I'm fairly calm and expressing myself. Right. And mm -hmm. so, and generally I'm very happy. I think there's been times when I, when the working in software industry has been hard, but I would consider myself pretty lucky that I've managed to dodge a lot of the problems that I talk about because I start becoming aware of them pretty early and turn that into a, a viable way to keep myself uh, employed and uh, able to work and produce something useful and also then learn uh, hobbies like painting and whatnot. Well, Zed, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on with us. It's been a blast. I mean, you, you came on the show before I didn't get a chance to talk to you then. It was so long ago, but to yeah. now finally get a chance to circle back eight years later, almost ish. And, uh, it's been it's been a blast. Thank you so much for sharing what you've what you've shared here, and keep the tweet storms coming. I, I like that stuff. He's off Twitter, man. You gotta. Well, you, well, you gotta he's coming somewhere. Said, what's the best way people can get a hold of you? Like if they're not going to attack you or or anything like that, but or give you death threats. Like you you're open to <laughs> to, to conversation, right? Like we've had a great conversation totally. here. You, yeah, so yeah, totally. is it email? Like what's the best way that folks can't get you on Twitter anymore? Uh, how should um, we get in touch? Uh, yeah. So what you can do is I have my blog, zedshaw.com. That's kind of my personal little thing. You can go there, uh, pop a comment in. I'll probably write a little blog post about this and announce it so that way people can go and comment, right? And uh, if, if you want to talk to me about books and stuff like that, you can go to um, at L-Z-S-T-H-W. So learn Zed Shaw the hard way. And that's my Twitter. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then that's pretty much it. And, uh, if you want to buy my books, I would really appreciate it. And, uh, you can go to learncodethehardway.org and you can get them there. And, uh, I'm also in the future going to be producing a, um, a, a painting book, a painting course. So totally free. I'm taking the money that I make from my programming books and I'm going to see if I can do some free painting education. So just putting stuff up on YouTube and totally free. Uh, for people to learn to paint because I, I love it. It's helped me so much. Nice. Um, it's like one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And it's really not that hard. Like, I think if people are making money off piles of garbage and that's considered art, then <laughs> you, you can paint some really crappy oil paintings and it's totally art and it's fun. All right, that's it for this episode of The Changelog. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors, Rollbar, Linode, and OzCon. Also, thank you to our bandwidth partner, Fastly. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we catch our errors before our users do here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This show is hosted by myself, Adam Stokoviak, and Jared Santo. Editing is by Tim Smith. The music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find news and podcasts just like this at Changelog.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.